when we are uh, putting together our electrical estimate, how to break it down, how to make it easy for you, because, um, man, electrical has to be the most time-consuming and can be the most difficult uh, trade to do an estimate for. Uh, you have to make sure you pay good attention to detail. All the symbols look alike, but they are not and tend not to be. You'll find a lot of mistakes. And so the, the biggest thing about uh, producing the electrical estimate is that you have to have a good counting tool. So you have to have a, a tool that will assist you in counting and uh, help you in not making mistakes. Okay, and so when we think about the basics of our uh, electrical estimate, we know that the electrical set, if it does not have a site plan, right, will have two plans. It'll have the power plan and it'll have the lighting plan. 
the power plans all everything in the building that needs power and it tends to be the most difficult of the two plans and the lighting plan is the plan where all the lights are and how they're controlled and then the third thing that makes uh, completing an electrical estimate really difficult is determining your wire uh, con and conduit totals for branch circuitry for your power plan. If it's not already noted on the plan, sometimes they'll note it on the construction docs, so you just follow the lines where they lead you, but in a lot of cases, they're not shown, especially for the lighting plan, and so you have to make sure you kind of understand uh, you do understand the symbols on the lighting plan and that can somewhat assist you in determining an, a route to draw your lines for your wire and your conduit. For your uh, single line diagram it's pretty simple because the panels are where they are on the plan and they go to a particular other panel and that is where it is and so it's easy to be accurate with those totals but again when you're doing the wire and conduit totals you're not going to be you're not going to get the exact same number as the electrician or 10 electricians that are doing the same thing is not going to get the same number but what you want to do is make a good effort to represent the branch circuitry and the lighting based on the plans in the best way uh, you can and in the neatest way you can because if you're an electrician you're not just going to throw the wire all over the ceiling you're probably going to run it you know everything that's going to one panel you'll probably be running that all together somehow you know and gathering it all together on one side of the building and if another panel is in the middle of the building then you're going to run and route everything towards that way so that kind of helps too okay and so you need a good counting tool and you need a good uh, segment tool to measure lines and lengths okay and uh, so we'll look at uh, an actual estimate to show you what you want to think about when you are doing your uh, getting your estimate together. Now this is the way I represent it and I've uh, completed electrical estimates only God knows how many and electricians like the format because it's very clear it tells them everything they need to know and if they know their trade which they do they can determine if the numbers that you're giving them is kind of crazy or not or overboard okay and so you got to think okay number 12 wire you're going to have always a lot more of that because why because most of the power components run with three number 12s and so you'll run one length for the conduit but you got to times that by three if we're talking about the home runs okay and so yeah so the way we break it down we have a section for our wire and our conduit so all of the wire for even including for the uh, single line and then MC cable most of the branch circuitry can be run with MC cable where all of the home runs of course have to be number 12 or if it's a particular type of mechanical equipment it's going to tell you you need uh, three number tens and a number six or vice versa or whatever and you'll know from that okay and so we break that down all the wire all of the conduit totals by length and of course we use a cost book to give us the material cost for the uh, wire and the conduit now rest assured that if you use a cost book that's very accurate like we do we use craftsmen well our material cost for the wire and the conduit is going to be five percent within local pricing so not 5% within what your supplier is going to charge you. Okay, so that's a thing to think about too. So if you want to make sure you put the cost of what your supplier is going to charge you, you're always going to tweak these numbers. Because the supplier is not going to give you his cost, right? They're probably going to mark it up two or three times the cost per linear foot. And so you have to keep that in mind, um, you know, just go by your material suppliers uh, as, as far as the material cost. But again, if you have a good cost book, you're always going to use the man hour totals from the cost book because 
that will make you way more competitive and in line with industry standard because these numbers come from the industry standard meaning it equates to if you go to the mechanic right you need an alternator i'm old i don't, I don't think you need alternators any unless you got a bucket which is okay because buckets are nice <sighs> The book will tell you how long it's going to take the mechanic, right? Well, same thing for the construction industry. Construction industry knows how long it's going to take to do absolutely everything. And so that's per unit. So it takes 0 0.017 of a man hour to install one linear foot. So it does the math and it's 15.73 linear foot. You want to always do something like this. You want to always get it from a cost book. You're always going to win, especially if you bid a lot. And I'm always going to lose clients because I'm always telling them my secrets. But that's okay because when you, you never lose, right? So use a cost book because you want to be accurate. You don't want to go by, oh, I've been doing this for 30 years. It's going to cost this much because you could be shorting yourself. And you could be overcharging the client and you won't win. And so by using a cost book, you know you're in line with industry standard. You can, you know, test the waters, send out, if you've been to three GCs, send them all the lowest or send each one, tweak it a little, every estimate, whatever, but always try to go by industry standard, okay? You'll always be guaranteed to be really close in the competitive portion. And then your material cost, you just got to make sure don't go with one supplier, right? There's suppliers all over the country. You can send your stuff to eight of them right and just go with the lowest most of them are free shipping all that stuff so that's something to always think about as a uh, electrician and the estimator is supposed to give good tips too so all right so counts you got to make sure you have everything all your wiring devices everything from our power plan basically is on here all your junction boxes for your tv outlets for your phone outlets don't forget those Plus, it's always going to say three-quarter inch conduit to the ceiling. So make sure you know how high the ceiling is. It could be 10 feet. It could be 16 feet. It could be 12 feet, whatever. So you want to make sure you have all that. And then all of everything basically in the switch gear portion for me is everything in the uh, single line diagram and all of the disconnects that uh, and all of the breakers. Okay, and so you get these numbers, what, by counting the breaker panel, and I've got this many of that, you know, good counting tool. And then cost book will give you a pretty good, uh, for you, all of your disconnects and all of your breakers and stuff, you can go by the cost book. They, they give you a pretty good, it's up to a point, you see why I have zeros. So up to a point, uh, Sometimes your material, you want to go with your, and I, I mean, for the electrician, um, you always want to go with your supplier, especially nowadays and since COVID and stuff. And so I leave all these zeros, but I do the man hour totals and all that comes from a cost book. And again, the cost book is what the industry says. You can do it in, in less time. And, and, you know, and most people say, oh, it's giving me 15 hours. I can do it. In. Okay, well, that's great. But adjust it. Right? Put seven hours, then you'll be even more competitive. But this is what the cost book says. So I'm not trying to cheat you from the cost book. You can cheat yourself after you know what it should be. All right? So, and then all of our lights, right? Counting tool. Really good counting tool. And again, you're going to get your lighting package depending on the uh, type of, you know, if it's like an Applebee's or cheesecake factory they have a supplier you call them they'll give you the material cost for all the lighting package and you just fill in the blank afterwards but of course uh, we give everything an hour for the lighting and you can be even more detailed than that because most things don't take an hour unless it's a track light then we give 0.25 of an hour for that and then bottom line we have the permits you got to add that trenching if it applies to your site if you have a site site lighting because some of my electricians have to be responsible for the trenching of the underground you know power or whatever so you want to have that switch gear package cost fire package some high voltage electricians do that too and then the lighting package fill all in the blanks and this is our number minus overhead and profit and fill that in but 
you go to our set so this would have happens to have a site plan and so you know straightforward you know this is probably doing too much they may go zip zip you know well, from here to that who knows but I don't know but I do the most uh, uh, I'm not saying that I don't think that's conservative but you know this may be I mean in the real scheme of things if they have to trench that they may run they may not trench it again to go there they may just go back here and then go like that who knows but for the purpose of our estimate every estimator has to figure out that same thing so we're going to give it the most leeway okay in terms of so we know this is underground we know that's pvc because it's site right so we don't have to think twice about that and we know that it's three number tens in a three quarter inch pvc home run two position number three in panel c so the panels were, I, I took it from here, and then once I get into the building, I add whatever addition to wherever the panel is in the building. And you gotta account for it coming up, right? PVC to EMT or rigid or whatever. So just add like 10%, you know, nothing that's mind boggling, especially for initial estimate, you know, because you wanna bid as much as you can now. But once you win with a consider you, yeah, you want to go back with a fine tooth comb and say, okay, is everything covered? Now I made everything not covered. So this is our power plant. And these are all of our outlets and all of our everything. Duplex, right? Phone and data. So I know that's a duplex junction box as opposed to a simplex or a single one. Let's see. Fill in everything. This had a lot of bubbles. Okay, so good counting tools is critical. Now, when it comes to your branch circuit, right, you gotta look at where everything is connected. These are both going to position 27, panel E, so I can say these are connected here, and they're probably home run to that position, right, because they're quads, so yeah. Okay, same thing here. I can run it here, branch circuit, and then I'm going to run an imaginary home run to wherever E is as far as running the wire. Okay, let me see where I have my power wire. Do I have it? I might have done it on a different page. Okay, no, there it is. See? So things I know that are going together to the same position on the panel. Okay, I'm going to run those all together, and then I'm going to home run that from that end somewhere to wherever the... Here, here's... Uh, relocated C and where's E so normally they'll put everything like close yeah here's E panel A E and B and C and then the disconnects okay so all we can do is make the lines from where the plans say the stuff is okay and we're giving it a good representation we got some underground so that's going to be PVC and then we have to transition it up through the new partition this is a floor box uh, it shows it shows it on the table but chances are it's in the floor or the you know contacts are anyway okay and so you have to do all of that okay and all your lights and the same thing with the lights you know that they're going to E6 every other one E6, all of these are going to E6, so you want to maybe put a little more diagonal, add 10 or 20%, because you got to, I mean, you know you want to give a good representation if it's not already given, because we know these two are going to the same place and then going to that, and they're all going to be connected, and, you know, so you want to do your best to give it a good representation of how the electrician may run the wire. And then I think we added like 10 or 15, 25%. Okay. And that the electrician, you know, will be able to determine if that's a good, uh, good number. And then we give them the takeoff. It's like, Hey, should we be doubling this? Because the person that does the work doesn't know exactly how you should do it. Okay. CT cabinet. Now we had to determine for our power how far, cause yeah, the main distribution panel, we must go to 
You had a good counting tool, okay? Good counting tool, because you have to count all your breakers. And where's the single line? I think it was maybe in the beginning. So yeah, you gotta look at the single line and say, okay, where is, where is the single line? Single line, where are you? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're just gonna keep it moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Where is it? Did I check there already? Of course, no, I did not. Okay, so mechanical equipment, you wanna make sure you know any of the home runs, basically, that are not all just number 12. And you wanna pull that out, make sure you know where that is and run it to the proper, you know? So you'll have all of the wire configurations, the number eights, number tens. So everything's not always uh, three number twelves, depending on the piece of equipment. So that's why they give you that. You gotta make sure you pull that out. Go back to the power plan, figure out where that piece of equipment is and do your linear measure to the panel that it should be. And then say, okay, it's two times, three times that distance and then one times that distance for the number 10 and then a, a one inch conduit. Okay, so then for the single line, right, for all of the feeders, you have to physically go to the power plant. We saw that the main distribution panel was on the outside of the building. Well, in relation to panel A, you gotta find it. So we look here and we say the main distribution panel is connected to A, to B, to C and to D. And then it looks like B and E are connected. And I gotta figure out all of the physical distances for all of the power feeders to know the exact lengths, right? So I say, okay, where is the main distribution panel? We just saw it right here. So from there to all of the panels, pretty much. So we had to, do, 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 do. let's see, there we go. Oh, they're already, main distribution panel. Let me take it out, there we go. Main distribution to A and B is that one. Main distribution to D, take it out, is that one. Main distribution to C, take it out and put it back, is that one. So now I know those actual links, plus uh, add like 10 feet. Okay, so the basics of electrical estimating is having a real good counting tool and practicing on your conduit links. Now you may look up and get some plans that already have all the lines drawn and you just follow those but when it, you don't just know when it's the power plan this is telling you that these two outlets are going to the same position in the panel so the power feeder I can use for that can run together same with this same with that and these can run together E25 oh we did and then at some point we're going to imaginary run it to the appropriate panel for the home run which we did and uh, we did that already. Okay, so that's the only tricky part. Good counting tool. Count all your devices, run all your wire, and pay good attention to your single line because those are, this is where the money is at. So you have to know, make sure you really measure very well those links because those higher uh, wires are very expensive as opposed to number 12. So you wanna be very accurate in your measurements. Okay, and then you have a beautiful estimate all broken down in the way you want, but the way we know our electricians like is all the wiring conduit, all the wiring devices, then everything in the single line and the disconnects. Then we go to the lighting plan and then any additional items, okay? So we would love to teach your class one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we teach uh, for only $100 a month. We will design a plan for you. We will meet once or twice a week. You'll have tests and you'll get certified. But if you have any questions, please send me an email at education at sfjohnsonconsulting.com. Let me know what you think, and please look out for the next uh, presentation. Have a good one. 
Hey everyone, this is Stacy with SF Johnson Consulting and Construction Services and in this video we're going to discuss the basics of plumbing estimating and what we need to consider and what we need to look at if we're going to be a uh, an estimator that handles specifically plumbing and you know what comes first, second, and third. Okay, so this is the cover sheet for the plumbing set and it's going to give us all of our uh, plumbing fixtures, everything that we're going to be installing, and it will give us the size of the hot water, cold water, and um, the sanitary pipe sizes and the vent size. And so that's important when it comes to uh, your uh, rough ends. And so we know that if we're going to install plumbing equipment for the very first time, we need to install and need to add to our estimate what's called the rough end cost. And that is the additional cost to install the hot water and cold water, uh, hot water, cold water, and sanitary systems to that piece of plumbing equipment for the very first time. So you always have to consider that. Well, in addition to your plumbing fixtures themselves, and so if you have a good cost book, it's going to give you the cost per type of fixture, and of course the man hour units that it's going to take you to install that. So please never forget that in its specific. Uh, to only new construction. If you have a renovation, it doesn't apply. So if you're going to just take one water closet out and install it in another in, in a renovation, that would not apply. So roughing costs only apply to new construction. And so here are your fixtures and then all your typical symbols. You know, we're going to replace water heater. So this is a good idea of all the things that you're going to have to find the prices for. And as uh, we know, just like for the electrical set, there are two plans. There's one for the sanitary system, it's sanitary and vent system, and then there's another one for the water, gas, and whatever other systems that are uh, appropriate to this type of building and, and this what the, these people are doing inside the building. Uh, because this is uh, this is our set of uh, uh, auto repair shops. Uh, there is a, for the plumbing set, we'll have a uh, compressed air and a gas line as well. Okay, so this is a sanitary system. Of course, we have to have a good tool that was going to measure linear feet because, yeah, our piping is in linear feet. And so if you have a good cost book too, you don't have to really consider angles and, and uh, reinforcements because all of that is considered in the price if you do the assembly price for plumbing for that type and size it's going to include all of the supports any angles that it it assumes you need supports you need because based on industry standards it has to be supported at certain lengths or whatever and so if you have a good cost book that'll help you eliminate having to do this and the you know small little things especially if you you bid a lot Right? And so always, 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 when, when we bid a lot, we're going to use a cost book, we're going to use a very good digitized software to make our measurements. But if we win, right, if they, if we win, then we go back and we do a, re, a very good detailed overview of what we've done to make sure that price is appropriate. If it's more than 30 days, you have to look at the material cost again to make sure it's the same and that kind of stuff. So, okay, so the plumbing plan, we take all of our linear measurements and don't worry about the fixtures because we're going to use this uh, riser diagram to count all of our fixtures. Okay, so we use all the plans to measure our linears. So that's uh, sanitary and vent. And then the other plan is for all of the cold water, hot water piping. Okay, run into the same fixtures, of course. And so we just have to have a good tool to measure linear. And then this one has gas line. And so, same thing, just linears and compressed air. Now, when you have something like this, this is a one half inch compressed air line. And, um, and for this one, they wanted us to use black steel. So, and then a control, but this indicates we don't know where the end of the line's gonna be. And so in that case, you have to give them something. And so what I did is just give them to the end of the building. It's got, it's got to be somewhere within the building. At least you give a good allowance and then you let them know that as well. Okay. And so now the riser diagrams. 
you use the riser diagrams to determine the vertical measure of pipe because pipes go up and down, right? And your plan only shows you the horizontal measures of the pipe. But at certain location, the pipes are going up and down. And so that's what the riser diagram helps you determine the size and going up. So rule of thumb I always use is typically 10 feet per going up. So 10 feet, 10 feet, 10 feet, 10, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's how you determine and that's why I put a dot on each one. So two, two inch vent and every time I see that, okay, so I know I've added 20 of them. Well, I know that's 200 feet, feet of two inch vent vertically. And if you have a good cost book, it will give you a different cost for a horizontal uh, assembly price as opposed to a vertical assembly price. So you want to look out for that too. But the other thing is you use you can use the riser diagrams to count all of your uh, plumbing equipment and be very accurate as opposed to, uh, I always like using it from the riser diagram. And remember, you're going to have different risers. So you have a gas riser, you have a sanitary riser. It's typically going to be the same uh, things that you're counting, so you don't have to count it twice. But look on in the water plan, like if there's a water heater, that's not really sanitary. So it wouldn't be on the sanitary riser, it would be more on the water riser. So things like that you need to look out for. Or if it's an oil interceptor, which is a sanitary system type thing, it would only be on the sanitary riser, not on the water riser. So those are kind of little things you need to look out for. But other than that, you could just use one of the risers to do all of your equipment, your uh, plumbing equipment counts, and all of your venture roofs. Okay, so, shoot. And then there's a gas riser. And see, all of these measures are on your plan. The horizontal measures are all on the plan, so you don't have to measure that. Riser diagrams are just to show you where the vertical measure up and down is. So when you put your estimate together, this is basically what we do. And of course, we love detail. So all of the horizontal uh, work, and it says PVC, but it's not. I mean, sanitary is PVC. Uh, the water is uh, copper. Okay, so that's all the horizontal measures of pipe and how many linear feet. And then this is the vertical measure of pipe and how many linear feet. And then, uh, of course, all of the fixtures, right? The cost and then the rough ends that apply. And then, of course, we're always going to add a cost to uh, connect the existing uh, waste, vent, water to the new service. And then the vent to roofs and then all that little stuff. And you want to check your specifications because you most likely have to have insulation for the pipe. Okay? And testing the system, especially with plumbing. Okay, so you want to break it down in very good detail. Okay, if you'd like to take a class with us, let us know. We'd love to uh, show you how to do, and basically what we do is start with uh, very simple projects and then work our way up to hotels, so you know what to do in all, each event and how to determine, again, just each of the measures, how to determine up and down the walls and the rough end cost. Those are things that are important that you have to make sure you include. That's not necessarily on the plans, right? So you know you have to include that and then testing and flushing the system. So if you have any questions, please let me know at education at sfjohnsonconsulting.com. Let me know what you think of the video and please keep your eye out for the next one. Talk to you soon. Hello everyone, this is Stacy with SF Johnson Consulting and Construction Services. And in this video, we are going to discuss the basics of structural estimating. And what we mean by structural estimating, um, basically, uh, we're going to be looking at all the things that we look at in the structural set. So we will be looking at the foundation and for concrete, that is the only concrete scope of work that's in the structural set, although that may not be the only concrete, of course, in the project, especially if it's from the ground up, right? You'll have 
asphalt concrete in the site plan but if you're the concrete person you're going to do that concrete you're also going to do the concrete on the site plan but this is specifically for the structural set and so the only concrete in the st structural set is the foundation any column pads and anything associated with that and so for this project we had uh, this is our uh, crash facility where we had to in the structural set install or uh, adapt some existing concrete to uh, we had to like make a pit and so what we had to do always when you have existing concrete you're going to have to cut the concrete first so there's a cost for the cutting and then there's a cost for uh, removing the concrete so never forget that and then this was uh, one of the, the pits uh, the, the uh, paint pit that we had to create and what this is is all of the walls were 8 inch concrete walls and it was also recessed down with an 8 inch concrete foundation and so what is this this is a call out right where they're going to send us somewhere else to look at the construction of this but this we were able to do from this page and what we also have here well this this automatically tells us that we have some kind of columns that are going to be installed in uh looks like the existing foundation yeah in the existing foundation and so what we need to do is determine what the 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 height the width and the depth of the column pads and so in any structural set they're going to give you all of the structural components as they apply so the column pad or the pad footing it's two by six so a square two by six square and the depth is one foot four inches and so if you have a good cost book it will give you the cost for a column pad that's similar to that you may have to add the additional reinforcement um, but you I mean you'll you'll be able to do it okay and here it's telling us about lentils so a lentil is basically just a steel header so headers are typically wood right well lentils are headers but they're made out of uh, steel so anytime you see lentil just know it's the same as a header but it's made out of steel and the bearing plates for the column pads that connect the column to uh, the bolt and then we have some beams for which we'll be able to It'll be an I or W or C beam, which is something by something. And then we'll look on the plan, and that'll tell us what that is. And it's telling us, do we have the beam? Then we have to infill it with grout once we place it. And this is an existing building where we have to do some additional foundation work. Okay, and this is the... So when we have structural right we that that is our foundation that's any new roof framing or anything of that nature so here we have some new beams that are going to be placed along the existing metal joists okay so they're w beams w12 by 19 so what's that mean um, that means that they are able to hold 19 pounds per linear foot and so we'll measure how many linear feet all together and we'll, uh, multiply that by 19 and that tells us how many pounds because when we do the beams C beams W beams I beams it's fabricated metals and those are priced by the pound and so we need to be able to determine just for these types of beams how many pounds we are talking about. And again, we take the second digit, multiply it by the length, that gives us how many pounds. 
And then we also had some sea beans. Right, so we have different ones. So what is this? This one says that the strength of this sea beam will hold 12.7 pounds per linear foot. And so we do the same thing. However many linear feet times 20.7, that gives us how many pounds, and then we're able to put that on our, on our estimate. Okay, so, you know when it comes to the column pads, you know, you have to, uh, you know, have a good indication from your cost book, you know, how to price it. You know, there's no way to guess that. So you really have to have the tools you need when it comes to this kind of stuff. And when it comes to your beams, too, you have to have a good cost book to tell you because based on the weight, it goes from uh, 0 to 20 pounds. It's a certain amount a cost per pound then we go from 20 to 50 pounds it's a certain cost and then from 50 to 75 pounds and I'm talking weight per linear foot that second digit and anything over a hundred pounds per linear foot that's like a specialty thing there's no cost book that's gonna have that information okay so that's very important but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this on hold because I don't think I have yeah, I don't think I have the structural estimate up, so I'm going to place you on hold for a second while I give you a kind of a visual on what your estimate should look like for a structural, uh, for the structural portion. So, be right back. Okay, so now we're looking at the estimate for actually that project. And so we have the column pads, and there were six of those, and from all you know, all of this gives us, uh, we get all this information from the cost book. So the cost for the formwork, the steel, and for the concrete. And it's per column pad. And here is our, uh, our C1. So that was what that was. Our, uh, our columns are three and a half by three and a half by one quarter. Each one was, uh, 10 feet so we estimate it well from the section view it's 10 feet high and we have seven of them and so those we are able to get uh, hollow structural steel you're able to get a cost per linear foot so we got that for that the base plate and the anchor bolts and then now the fabricated metals right we had w8 by 18 or 19 linear feet so we had uh, 342 pounds and then there was a bottom plate anchored to it so that was another cost for that one and I believe we had the yeah all three C beam C12 we had 228 pounds of that and then the bolts and then we also had a 12 by 19 and there was 522, and we had 29 linear feet of that. And so 522 pounds. And then all of all of the other things, you know, all of the supports, right? Bearing plates and supports, and then the new foundation. So let's go back to the plan. The new foundation, and let's look at some section views. It's important that you're able to go to the section views this is the pit that we talked about right the paint booth where now we have the section view right section view you got to really be able to determine and take your time and look at stuff like this because the section view is as if we took this is a knife right we cut straight down and then we opened it up and now we're standing in the middle of that and this is what we see Okay, so it gives us a more detailed view uh, so we can determine all of our rebar totals. We have a number five every eight inches both ways. Okay, so when you know you have your number five, number four, whatever, every 12 inches, eight inches, it's important to do, right, do the conversion. How many linear feet do you have, right? Change those linear feet to inches divide by the placement that tells you how many positions you have to lay the rebar and then however long it is 
And then if it's a square, you can just multiply by 2. I think in most cases, every time I've done it twice, whether it's a square or it's a rectangle, it's always been the same amount of rebar, Every whether I did it in this way and did the equation or this way, and it's always twice. So try it for yourself. I don't know. But just do it both ways so you're not sure. But when it says each way, you have to do it each way, right? This way, and then that's what these are showing, and then those dots are showing it's moving away from us. Okay, so it's really important that you're able to read section views very well. And it's not an easy thing, so just, you know, take your time. And there is a video on uh, the four views in the very, like, that's probably one of the very first videos I uploaded to try to give you a good understanding of the four views, plan view, section view, detail view, elevation view, and how to float from one to the other so you can have a clear understanding of the construction. You know, the, the takeouts and the callouts and all that stuff. Okay, so, so what we have here is basically this pit, right? These are the walls. These are the walls. They're eight inches wide and that's the the reinforcement so what it has it has this ledger pretty much the perimeter of the whole thing pretty much the perimeter that's what this is showing okay so structural is very detailed oriented and you really have to just take your time and probably make a few mistakes before you get it all right but the main thing is if you want to really do accurate rebar totals you know just take it one piece by one piece with mm, six inch three by h hollow steel at the 18 angle set with da, 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 hmm, at the 18th entire pit yeah okay with at the 18th this is I gotta look into the hollow steel with mm, okay every 18 inches entire pit perimeter okay and then the vertical right and then the horizontal so the vertical is the up and down conduit so you have to say well it's that many linear feet and it goes the whole perimeter too so you you know that many linear feet at the eight inches so what's the perimeter what's the perimeter right however many linear feet change it into inches divide by eight then you know you have that many placements times the length at each placement you know so really easy to do okay and this is our awning okay where we had to now this is an existing wall right so what do we have to do a couple things costs a couple things and to drill the holes in here so there's four right we have a section view so we have two on one side two on the other side of this these plates so we have what one two three four plates four eight screws and then we have to drill through the beam Okay, so all of that is actually on our estimate. Foundation, paint booth walls, paint booth foundation, and then we have some demo of that, uh, some rods. And the demo shouldn't be on here unless they just caught us by surprise and it wasn't even on the demo plan, which those rods weren't. Okay, so the awning support, the base plate, the anchor bolts, drilling the holes. See how much drilling holes is the uh, steel? It's very expensive. But it's only two feet, so it wasn't too bad. Okay, so you want to make sure you include everything that's in the set. Structural could be one of the hardest ones, but what are you doing? Structural, you know you're doing uh, concrete foundations. <coughs> My grandkids gave me a cold for Thanksgiving concrete foundations um, column pads columns beams um, could be roof 
roof components, right? Because if you have a single story building, the structural is the foundation, the exterior walls, beams, columns, and the roof, the roof. So if we're putting new holes in the roof, we have to make sure we secure those holes in the roof. Okay, so, and this is our new uh, wall elevation. This is our 18.75. Basically, we're making an opening for a new overhead door. So we had to have that beam. So that's the elevation view of that. We even have the plan view, so we only see it from here, right? So we had to include these on both sides in a new beam and the connectors. And then in the demo portion, if you saw the demo, we uh, already accounted for putting the hole in the, in the exterior wall. Okay, so to produce a good structural, you know, uh, oh, let's see, we had to let's see, drill in the holes. I think that was for the uh, the pit. Let's go back for this. This is the A over uh, two A S two O one. So that was our um, trench drains. So we had to put some rebar in there. So, and I believe we had to drill some holes. Yeah, in the foundation. Oh, in the foundation, we had to drill holes. So that's where that came from. Okay, so you have to really be, uh, and that's our column pad and how we're connecting the column. The anchor bolts for, you know, all of those things have to be reflected piece by piece. And that's why a good cost book is valuable because it's going to take you forever to, to get this done, right? And, I mean, I was lost. I'm like, how do you price a beam? But yeah, with enough research to show me, yeah, you gotta figure out how many pounds it is. Okay, so just go through your set. Everything on your set should be reflected on your estimate. So the person you're doing the estimate for, right, the estimator has to be able to see the project when it's finished and be able to look at all of this mess that they give you, okay? and be able to break it down. So if you have any questions, roof framing. Oh, okay, we didn't go over this. Okay, so that's the, uh, all of those, uh, the opening, opening, see they, they built, they only show you one in the section view, but they actually had three new garage door openings. Okay, so. Oh no, here it is. And they have one, two, three, four new garage door openings. This was something else. But that's all the fabricated metals. So that's why I said we had, what, 29 feet? How many? A lintel one? Let me see. 74 feet, yeah. That was that 522 pounds or whatever. Okay, so we had to shore up all of the secure uh secure all of the new exhaust fans in the roof because that's weight right so we have to be able to make sure it doesn't fall through the roof and so that's all the uh, exhaust fan secure uh, bracing that we have to account for c301 let's look at that real quick c301 c Okay, so yeah, 10 inch, 12 gauge on each side of that. Okay, so we can go back to that. You see, basically that's going on each side and you have to connect it. Okay, and then D, you connect it like this. Okay, so you gotta be able to make sure you know 
how to get from what they're trying to tell you to the next thing and get it on your estimate. And make sure you get it all together. Mm, something around here. Fan supports. 240 feet. And then the Samson Tie L70. <laughs> so, so much fun. But yeah, structural is no joke. Okay, that and electrical probably and excavation, especially if you have bad plans. It can be one, three of your most difficult of estimates to put together. Okay, so this is the basics of structural estimating, right? Just your structural set. And only the concrete in the S plans. If you have concrete in the C plans, civil set, it's not on here. You don't put that on here. Everything is separated just this way because it's all its own thing, right? So, you know, even if there is interior building concrete, it won't be on here and it won't be on the civil set. It'll be in the on the estimate associated with the architectural set. Okay, so you will we'll come up with a video in detail to show you like what is how, how you separate estimates because a lot of people just throw everything on there and those are the estimates that get thrown away right because it shows that the person doing it on, you know they don't know what should be on their estimate so unless somebody specifically says like for the electrician put the trenching on that well that's different because electrician's job is to be an electrician and the structural set is it's understood that these things are on it so all of these will be on a structural estimate concrete the foundation you know any of the structural components um, all of the beams and columns and stuff it's understood those will be all on the same estimate okay so if you have any questions please let me know and please give me your comments and thank you for your very nice comments and your likes and all that good stuff please continue to like let me know if there's something in particular you need help in and you want to know because there's very few things about this mess that i don't know and i like to share so thanks a lot uh email me at education at sfjohnsonconsulting.com i hope you had a wonderful thanksgiving and look for the next video talk to you soon
once a day that I would pray for you I'd go and misbehave just so you'd notice too Sneaking looks up and down from across the room and Damn, what a hell of a view I feel good, you look great I like you, I can't wait A first time, a first day You're so fine, I'm so late You sip wine, I drink straight Don't waste time, to my place I feel my heart erase So catch me if I fall